Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, an automated cancer organoid culture platform to accelerate research and drug screening. I'm Christy Jewell of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Gibco by Thermo Fisher. Gibco Cell Culture Heroes is a program putting PhD and postdoc researchers around the world in the spotlight. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com forward slash cell culture heroes. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. You can also see at the top of the page multiple tabs. Please click through our related applications, upcoming and on-demand webinars, as well as links to the Cell Culture Heroes webpage. You may be our next Cell Culture Hero. Also, please notice that you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the Social Sharing tab and let your friends know that about today's event. Now, if you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the support tabs down at the top right of the presentation window, or you can let us know you're experiencing a problem by using that Ask a Question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Brooke Schuster. PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. For a complete biography on Brooke, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Brooke, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Christy, for that introduction. I would also like to thank Gibco and Thermo Fisher Scientific for inviting me to share my research. It has been a few years in the making, and I'm so excited to finally get to talk to you all about my project. For today's presentation, I'll, I have included an outline on what I will be covering. I'll first start with an introduction about myself and my lab, then on to the background of the project, following with the development and experimental progress, and finally touch on future work and outlook. Located in the United States in the heart of the Midwest, Chicago, Illinois is the third largest city in terms of population in the country and is home to many wonderful universities, including University of Chicago. University of Chicago is just south of the downtown area, or what we call the Loop, in a Chicago neighborhood called Hyde Park. University of Chicago has been consistently recognized to be one of the top 15 universities in the world with highly ranking science and medical programs, as well as globally ranked business and law schools. So a little bit about me. My name is Brooke Schuster. I was born and raised in the Chicago suburbs. I then attended University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, in more of the rural part of Illinois, right in the center of our state. And I completed a Bachelor of Science in both Integrative Biology Honors and Chemistry. So here's a fun picture. It's actually not just a picture of me with horses, but this picture was taken right next to the first lab I was ever in, and the lab was part of the School of Veterinarian Medicine, and it was when I first ever learned cell culture. And specifically, I worked with primary equine stem cells or horse cells. I am now, you know, doing something different as a fourth year PhD candidate at University of Chicago in the School of Molecular Engineering. So at University of Chicago, I'm a member of the Tay Lab, which is which I am mentored by Professor Savas Tay. The Tay Lab centers around bioengineering and systems biology. Our lab's model is to understand, model, manipulate complex biological systems, 
And to do that, we develop high throughput automated microfluidic systems that can perform quantitative dynamic measurements with up to a single cell resolution. So we have developed many different types of microfluidic devices, many of them capable of cell culture and even single cell culture. However, this presentation, we won't be focusing on single cell, but more are multicellular organoids. So now a little bit about the background of the project and why I developed this technology. So I would like to start by briefly discussing organoids. I do not want to go into too much detail as there are many cell culture hero presentations that dive deeply into why organoids are becoming such an important tool in research. So please check out all those wonderful presentations if you want to learn more and haven't already. But I definitely want to briefly touch on why organoid is so important and why we develop this whole technology based on them. So in summary, organoids are artificially grown masses of cells or tissues that represent an organ. They can be derived from differentiated tissues and be or differentiated tissues and be polyclonal or be derived from stem cells and be clonal. So typically they're embedded in a 3D matrix to provide support to these 3D structures. So this can be a natural ECM-based hydrogel or extra, extracellular matrix hydrogel, which can be typically derived from mice sarcoma cells. And examples of products would be matrigel or gel tracks, or they can be more synthetically derived hydrogel. And this becomes very important when we think about culturing and developing new technologies for these organoids. So overall, many studies have shown how they can reproduce the in vivo architecture, some of the functions, and the genetic signatures of these original tissues. So looking to compare organoids to other methods, especially in focusing on in the realm of cancer, so most commonly used and traditional 2D cell culture monolayers have no tumor cell heterogeneity. They grow very clonally, such as representing one cell grown in the tumor. And overall, they tend to be genetically unstable. They require mutations, which ultimately limit the number of passages you can grow them, which is very different from the organoids. For example, I have a one patient's organoid growing up in the 70s for passage numbers. Then in comparison to mice models, or what we call patient-derived xenografts, which is where we take a sample of the patient's tumor, implant it into a mouse, these can overall be very time-consuming and costly, have a very low throughput, and you also have problems with the mouse and human interactions in your experiments. So overall, organoids have been derived out of many different organs. Here are just a few exam examples. They can be der derived from both normal tissue and cancerous tissues. And then we even have organoids to represent different diseases, like cystic fibrosis. So there's many different applications for organoids. Overall, they have shown potential in biomedical applications, translational medicine, and potentially personalized therapies. Today we'll be focusing on the personalized cancer therapies or disease therapies to demonstrate my technology, but we also could apply this technology to the other applications as well. While today's talk is primarily a technology talk, the cancer I'll be focusing on to demonstrate this technology is pancreatic cancer. So previously published in the Journal of Molecular Cancer Research by colleagues and our collaborators in Kevin White's lab, they developed patient-specific organoids. So these are derived from the surgical samples obtained during the pancreatic cancer removal surgery from 10 different patients. And these are all patients and 
the samples were collected from our very own University of Chicago Hospital. And they examined in their paper the phenotypic and genetic features of these organoids and then compared them to their original uh, tumor for all of these 10 patients. So sneaking in some of my own data into this introduction, here are some more images of pancreatic cancer organoids, or specifically we have patient-derived pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma organoids. So like the ducts of the pancreas, you can see that the organoids are hollow in the inside. And so organoids, unlike monolayers or 2D structures, they are 3D structures. To, so to fully image them, we take different Z stacks or image slices of the organoids. So and these are fixed and stain. You can see the blue is our daffy stain or our nucleus stain. And then the red is the phylloid and stain, or F-actin. So why is pancreatic cancer important to model? So pancreatic cancer is currently the third leading cause of cancer-related death in the U.S. And it's recently suppressed breast cancer. So for example, when I first gave this presentation for my candidacy exam, it was currently number four, so rapidly changing. And then it's also expected to surpass colon cancer by the end of this year to become the second leading cause. It is unfortunately one of the few cancers that survival hasn't improved substantially for more than 40 years. So currently we have no early detection tools to diagnose this disease during the early stages. And in combination with its large genomic landscape as seen with this image, Variations between patients makes it very difficult to treat. So now focusing in on the main purpose of my project, project with organoids established as a physically relevant model for both basic and clinical application, there becomes a need to improve the speed, cost, and reproducibility of culture and comprehensive screening of these organoids such as looking at the phenotypic changes and drug sensitivity. So we aim to develop an integrated platform that we can advance research on organoid models, screen and mirror real life patient treatment, and potentially facilitate treatment decisions for personalized therapies. So one way to achieve these objectives involves the creation and standardization and miniaturization of assays ran in parallel that can be performed in a highly reproducible environment with the utilization of minimum amounts of reagents using a automatic system that allows users to culture and screen thousands of conditions with minimum training and investment. And so the use of microfluidic technology meets all of these requirements. So the lab I'm in, the Tay Lab, is known for having expertise in creating different types of microfluidic cell culture devices for all different types of functions and experiments. Last year, we published a 1,500 chamber cell culture chip with individually addressable chambers. We even have a 10,000 chamber prototype. So with our previously developed technologies, we have created automated control, high throughput and parallel assays, viable cell culture, and individually addressable culture chambers. However, the requirement of an extracellular matrix, such as hydrogel, that is usually temperature sensitive, which means we work with it when it's, and we embed the organoids into it when it's cold around four degrees Celsius. And then as it warms up to room temperature, it solidifies. So this is important to support the 3D cell culture and its ability to thrive. However, this makes all these previously developed technologies obsolete through the clogging of the fluidic channels. Um, also, most of our devices are around 100 to 200 micrometers tall, 
and these would not be able to accommodate the large organoid size, which is around 400. So outside my lab, people have attempted various microfluidic devices that are indeed compatible with this hydrogel, but they tend to fall, fall short on being high throughput and being able to accommodate this large organoid size. So how about organoid culture outside of microfluidics? So most common is these plate-based experiments. To add automation, people tend to use these automated imaging systems, but overall, we still have limited high throughput. Um, with these automated imaging systems, there's no intervention during the experimentation. You stick it in the system to be imaged for your drug treatment, and you can't touch it during it. And then overall, it tends to be very costly and labor intensive especially when you think of terms of number of pipetting steps. So now we know what we want to achieve and our goals are defined and we know about the different components. Well, let's talk about how we develop technology to meet our needs. So the final developed platform ended up being a two-part system. So we'll start with the first device, which is our organoid culture chamber device. So resting on top of a glass slide fitted into a microscope slide holder, the first layer of the device is a 200 chamber well layer. It's made out of a material called PDMS, which is a polymer that's clear enough to see through while also being biocompatible. The design of the device is geometrically engineered to accommodate the large organoid size with its uh, tall chamber height, while also being really easy to pipette into to accommodate the hydrogel. And here's an example of me pipetting the device. This is the only pipetting step for the entire experiment. Super easy. I can probably do it in less than two minutes. So once our organoids are loaded into the chambers, a second PDMS-based channel layer rests on top of the well layer. And this is reversely bonded through a clamping-based system consisting of a clear plastic top with screws and knobs, knobs to seal the device together as seen in the upper left-hand corner. So here's once the device is put together, here's a side view of what it looks like. So combined with the well layer, the channel layer provides the fluidic channel to provide growth media during the experiment, or in the beginning of the experiment. And then as you go later on to the experiment, we can provide other drugs or other chemical stimulants to the organoids. So most complex PDMS-based microfluidic devices are made from PDMS layers or multiple PDMS layers that are permanently bonded together, usually through plasma bonding. But to accommodate this uh, hydrogel, we had to make the bonding reversible through the clamping-based platform. But this also has some pros to it, in addition to being able to accommodate the hydrogel. So we're able, with this platform, we're able to easily harvest the organoids. After the experiment is completed, for you know off data or off device data collection or passaging the organoids after the experiment is complete. So both the chambers, we have the deep gel chambers around 600 micrometers and the channel height were specifically engineered to provide a suitable 3D environment for the large mature organoids growing below. And then we also, the channel height allows for enough liquid nutrients in the channels to the growing organoids without disrupting or washing away the gel-based environment below. So with it being built on a microscope platform, we're e able to easily image all these organoids continuously during the entire experiment. And here's the example of what one well looks like at 10x magnification 
with actual organoids in it. So overall, this entire 3D culture chamber platform was also engineered and optimized to reduce bubble formation and prevent leakage or interference or cross communication between the different channels. Completed, we have 200 chambers capable of up to 20 different conditions, whether these are different organoid growth media or drug cocktails or other chemical stimulants, and we can hold up to 10 different patients at once. So now that we have our home for our organoids, we needed to design a system to automatically provide their growth nutrients and then experimental stimulants. So here's an example of a typical microfluidic setup. First, we have our built-in incubator to keep our organoids alive and happy for the entire duration of the experiment. I've done experiments for over two weeks and the organoids were super happy the entire time in the system. So with the microscope, we also have a automatic and programmable image acquisition. And then finally, we have the main part of the microfluidic system, we have our experimental control. And so this is controlled by a separate computer connected to an array of solenoid valves as highlighted in the top screen circle. And these valves control or help control the movement of fluids through a pressurized valve system. And this is what we will be calling microfluidic valves. So how do, these ooh, how do these microfluidic valves work? So microfluidic devices previously designed by our lab typically consist of a multiplex valve system to move fluids and cells in many different ways. These valves are based on valves designed by the Quake Lab in Stanford. So how they work is they, so you have the solenoid valve array connected to your computer that um, the computer tells the valve array when to apply pressurized water. This pressurized water then goes into these specialized channels, which I have labeled, labeled as the pressure slash control layer in that light blue. And once they're activated, they provide resistance to the media layer, or what we call the flow layer, which is where all of our media or drugs would enter. So we have the valves closed, media stops, open, close, open, close. So, um, however, with this, these gel-based cell culture systems, such as organ arrays, to, um, these would dramatically decrease our throughput and efficiency if we try to use these valve-based systems directly with our organoid cell culture. So in order to prevent that, we developed a second device to control and automate our experiment. So moving on to our second device, we have the multiplexer control device. And this consists of a multiplex array of different valves that can control the movement of various solutions so our currently device holds up to 30 different solutions, and they can direct them to various channels or multiple channels of organoids in various timing dynamically. So how this device connects with our organoid culture device, first we connect our solenoid valve array, and that's opening and shutting our microfluidic valve. And here's an example of the image again. And then we have our media or drug or other chemical inputs inserted, inserted on the top portion of the device. We then connect this device to and from our organoid home. And then we can collect the waste from the organoids here on the device. And then we finally have our experimental control that tells the device exactly what we want to do whatever experiment we want. And to control this, we can upload a file as simple as a Excel file to tell the computer what type of experiment we want to run. 
And then essentially, once you hit start, it's all hands-free, and the experiment, along with the automated imaging, runs on its own. So overall, this integrative system provides combinatorial and dy dynamic drug simulations in terms of hundreds of cultures and real-time analysis of organoids. So focusing in on cancer, we validated our system by facilitating individual combination and sequential drug screens on human-derived pancreatic tumor organoids. To talk, and I'll be talking about a lot more in the upcoming slide, but so the unique feature of the system is we're able to do dynamic or sequential drug treatment. And that means, so typically when you receive a combination chemotherapy in clinic, you don't get all three drugs given to you at once. Instead, you get one drug at a time through an IV. And so to demonstrate that, we delivered those drugs the way that most mirrored how you would receive them actually in clinic on that platform as we wanted to compare it to traditional methods where they would do a drug testing where they test all three drugs given at once. So more detail coming up with it. So with our platform developed, I would like to introduce some of the experimental data with the use of the platform and pancreatic cancer organoids along with FDA approved chemotherapies to fully demonstrate this platform in action. But before we want to begin the drug te testing, we look to establish organoid growth on the platform. So here's three different patients grown in parallel from single cells to multicellular organoids in just seven days. And you can see there's different size and shapes of the organoids in comparison to the different patients. So through this continuous imaging process, we end up with so much data. You know, we're taking different focuses of these organoids and at many different time points during the growth process. So to keep track of those growth, we wanted to quantify these images. So here's an example of some quantifications of these organoid growth for each patient over time. So each dot represents an individual organoid's area, and then a line fitted on top of these organoids where you're able to compare the different patients' growth rates to each other. So like a patient's cancer is unique, so are their organoids. So here's an example of this organoid growth um, video. And so we have patient one. We're going from single cells to multicellular organoids. You can watch them grow. Here's a patient two. And you can see a hydrogel bubble. So the platform's designed to remove those so it doesn't affect our imaging. And then finally, patient three. Okay, so to confirm our platform did not affect the development of these original organoids, we did an H&E analysis to confirm their morphology was consistent between systems. So to do that, we collaborated with Dr. Chris Weber, who's a pathologist at University of Chicago, and also helped develop these organoids. And he confirmed that between the traditional plate-based systems and the microfluidic platform, that the morphology stayed consistent for both patients. For example, patient one, we had a consistent, moderately differentiated morphology with necrotic luminal cells, and then patient four was well differentiated with more uniform features. And as I teased you guys in the intro with some of these images, we are able to, on this platform, not only fix in stain organoids, but we can always take different image slices or Z stack acquisition of these organoids, image acquisition, to, and which in turn will allow us to uh, be able to do a complete 3D reconstruction of these organoids on this platform. 
So here's 0 micrometer to 57 micrometer in different image slices. And again, you can see how the organoid is hollow in the inside. And then through these images and confocal imaging system, we can take 3D reconstruction like this. So finally, we looked at being able to test drug sensitivity through the use of imaging and the help of two fluorescent detectors. We have propidium iodine for cellular death, and then we, um, which is in red, and then we have caspase 37 for apoptosis in green. So first, we tried to do the more traditional methods where we just did four hours of drug treatment, then replaced with normal growth media for a duration of, and then watched the organoids for 72 hours. And then we also did a complete 72 hour duration of these FDA approved chemotherapies. So here's just a few image examples. We have the negative control, which is just our normal growth media. We have gemcitabine for four hours, gemcitabine for the full 72 hours. We have a commonly used a uh, chemotherapy combination, which is gemcitabine and paclitaxel. And then overall, we compare all our drug treatment data to a positive control, which is a known apoptosis inducer in organoids. So to see this all in action, here is an example of a video. So all we have the phase contrast, the green apoptosis, and red cellular death all overlaid to each other, and then essentially we're going from no drug to the strongest drug from left to right. So again, we have all these images, terabytes of data, but you know, how can I tell which drug was most effective? So we had to develop a way to analyze all this image data. So here's an example of all this image data quantified. So this is just looking at the apoptosis, which is the green stain for first um, single drugs and then combination drugs. And then to the left, we have the 72 hour of continuous drug treatment. And then to the right, we just have the four hours. Then after the four hours, it's just replaced with normal growth media. And as, was, as expected, the combination of drugs was more effective than just the single drug. And then we have the 72 hour was overall more effective than the four hour drug treatment. So I briefly showed our commonly used FDA approved chemotherapy drugs in the last slide, but to go over them in a little bit more detail. Um, I also mentioned so patients do not receive all three or two drugs all at once. Instead, they get them in a specialized delivery. So I wanted to be able to mimic that and mirror how the patients receive them in real life on my platform. So to do that, I looked at how they actually received it, and I developed a uh, timing for full Fearnox, full Fury, full Fox, gemcitabine, and 5-FU and then gemcitabine and paclitaxel. So to the left is just a cartoon illustration on what I did. And then here, again, I quantified the images of these now dynamic and combinatorial drug screening. While this is cool, we want to be able to, like, how does this dynamic delivery compare to traditional systems of doing it 72 hour or four hours. So for each of these different combinations, I compared them to the, the dy dynamic to the 72 hour or four hour counterpart. And interesting enough for this patient, I found out that the dynamic was more effective compared to the 72 hour and four hour. So looking at just the endpoint same analysis for all these different combinations. For all of them, the dynamic was significantly different from the four-hour treatment. And then for all of them, except for the last one, which is gemcitabine and paclitaxel, the dynamic uh, delivery was more significantly different 
than the 72 hour delivery. Which is especially interesting if we think in terms of drug concentrations, you're getting one drug at a time versus 72 hours, you get all three drugs at once. So that's just an overall higher drug concentration the organoids are receiving at one time. So it was very interesting to see that dynamic was more effective. So of course, um, you know, the main aspect and most unique, or the main focus of our technology is that we want to be high throughput as well as dynamic. So here's a heat map illustrating all those drug combinations and all the different timings delivered to three patients at once, and this was all in one device, one experiment. So we have patient one, patient two, patient three. To the left, we have that green stain, the apoptosis, and then to the right, and with the red, we have the cellular death. So uh, when I analyze all these data, each of these, the cell death images and the apoptosis images and seen to the right, are completely different set of images. They are not the same image at all. So it was interesting to see, and it was confirmation of the data analysis uh, system that you see the consistent drug sensitivity signatures between the apoptosis and cell death between each patient. Then also comparing each patient to each other, you see different unique drug sensitivities between the patients as well. So now that I showed uh, the technology in action and the data we acquired, you know, what's some of the future work and outlook for this platform? So just briefly some potential future work on this platform. So the first idea that we want to look into is cold cold co-culturing on this platform. So previous studies have been published and shown that organoids can be co-cultured with other different cell types on this platform. So one thing you could do is if you co-culture with cells to represent the stroma, you can kind of recreate this tumor microenvironment. You can also co-culture these organoids with immune cells as well. We also would like to look into chemotherapy drug resistance studies. And one way of doing this is that we've been developing organoids derived from fine needle aspirate, aspirations. So this is different from developing them from surgical samples. So we are able to take a sample from the patient before, right when they're diagnosed, before they ever have chemotherapy and surgery and then compare the organoids later on to, or the, or compared to the later on when you obtain the organoids through a surgical sample and see if their drug sensitivities, genetics change. And then as shown with the different application of organoids, the applications of, for organoids on this platform can really be endless. For example, just a few examples, we can use this platform for new organoid development to see which media works the best for them to grow or other disease studies. And then finally, so with this image data, I keep on mentioning that we end up with terabytes of data. So are we able to look and use um, machine learning based techniques to automatically analyze all this data for us. And so briefly to show what we've been working on um, is that, so to develop a technique, I've been working with an MD, PhD candidate named Sara, who is a machine learning and developing models expert. So we first wanted to look at, can we automatically segment these images? So there currently are techniques for 2D cell culture to segment images and to segment the cells. However, when you look at this image, all my organoids are different sizes. There's different textures. They're in different uh, Z focuses and different 
image planes, and it makes it very difficult to use current techniques. You can also see in the middle we have a media bubble, which uh, traditional techniques might pick up as an organoid. But using our model, we've been able to automatically um, segment it using a computer. But here's just one example. What if I throw in images that look different? We have different uh, cell concentrations, different number of organoids. We have different shapes and sizes of organoids. We have different textures. And no matter what we threw at it, it was able to predict with high accuracy um, segmenting the organoids. So using this um, same technique would be be able to predict cell death, and this would prevent the need for these fancy fluorescent dyes. Can we just predict, you know, how many organoids are alive and happy or dead based on just the bright field or phase contrast imaging? So just some brief um, preliminary work on this model. You can see we have the actual death stain to the left and what the model predicted. And this was based on the phase contrast imaging. The model did not see the fluorescent. And now we have the same well of organoids. However, this time they are completely dead. And left, we can see what the actual death stain is and then right what our computer model predicts. So um, please look out. Hopefully we'll have this published in the near future. So that includes my presentation for today. Please feel free to connect with me on my various social media platforms to keep updated on my research and publications. I've been trying to post more and more about my scientific work, including many organoid videos. I'm now ready to open up for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Brooke, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, Brooke, let's get started. We have so many great questions coming in already. Let's begin with this one. Have you tried other organoids besides pancreatic cancer organoids on the platform? Yeah, we have actually have tried colon organoids that we got from some colleagues at University of Chicago. And what's cool about those, they're not cancerous, they're benign organoids, so it shows that it doesn't need to be cancer. And then we've also have played around with some cell lines, for example, MDA, MB231, a breast cancer cell line. We grew in 3D um, cellular aggregates on the platform. I do hope to do um, more types of organoids in the future um, is the plan. Thanks, Brooke. Now, instead of the 200 wells, is it possible to custom design a platform using 96 well plates? So the microscope that I showed, you can see it behind me in the, my little profile picture, but also in that previous image, that microscope is uh, capable of any type of well plates. It could be, you know, 96 well plates or 24 well plates. Um, my platform itself, um, you can also, I have a 800 well, which had larger wells. Um, made out of PDMS as well. So that's very, you can make that to whatever amount of wells you want. Um, 200 is just the most optimal. And then using, so when you use well plates in the uh, microscope setup, it will not be automated anymore. So you would have to pipette. If you wanted to change different drugs, you would have to take the well plate off and pipette and then reset all your images. So it does make it a lot more difficult, but it is possible. What now? This question is two parts. What size are the organoid wells, and how much media does each channel hold? Uh, so each of the wells are around 1.5 millimeters in diameter. 
which holds around one microliter of volume of gel when you're pipetting it in. Um, so the height of the well is around 600 micrometers tall, um, and the channel heights are around 450 micrometers of height, and each channel, which has um, 10 wells, holds around 100 microliters of fluid or media um, in the above the gels. And what's the average size of the organoids? Uh, so this, you know, again, varies by patients. Um, some patients have organoids grow very largely, very quickly, and others tend to be smaller in size. But I would say, so when we do experiments, we look for the majority of them to be 100 micrometers in diameter to start the experiment, but by the end, a lot of them end up being 400, 500, 600 in diameter, but average definitely depends on each patient. Thanks, Brooke. Our next question, how do you ensure channel-to-channel -channel consistency when using organoids in assays because they are spontaneously generated and vary in size and shape? So yeah, this is a very good question and one I get a lot because you know, when 2D cell culture, you just count the cells, they all grow very uniformly, um, but organoids, you don't have that. You're dealing with patient cells. You know, each organoid in itself, even for one patient, is different. So to kind of correct for that, we first use replicates. And then another thing is um, all my, like, fluorescence data is normalized to account for the amount of organoids. And then that's another reason we're particularly interested in doing machine learning and having those segmentation images so we know exactly what volume of organoids we have. Uh, so very good question and something we definitely consider. Do you use only fresh organoid for culture or can you save samples under what condition and for how long? Awesome, yeah, another uh, good question. So all the organoids I used for my experiments weren't fresh because we had um, verified and confirmed that they were indeed um, similar to the patient's tumor in that previous paper um, from the Mo journal Molecular Cancer. Uh, so my colleagues confirmed them. So these organoids have been frozen down before. They can be cryopreserved and woken up from whenever you need them very easily. Um, they're very robust. and. Yeah, some of the organoids we have frozen down and they still um, wake up really easy. They're like five plus years old. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long and I don't know if anyone has that answer, but I do know that there's current biobanks for these organoids and that they can be cryopreserved very easily. Thank you, Brooke. Our next question also has two parts. How many spheres in the single culture well and how do you calculate every sphere? Okay, so I, I'm sure, so there's spheroids and organoids and um, my platform, I haven't tried culturing spheroids, but we, I'm sure it works if it works well with organoids, which are from um, primary cells. Um, but yeah, this is very similar to the previous question about you know how do we normalize or account for uh, every patient is going to have a slightly different um, population of, you know, and count of organoids. So I'd say typically for the size well, if you have ones that are maturing around 400 to 500 micrometers in diameter, we have around 10 um, per well. And uh, I forgot what the second part of the question is. Can you remind me? I can, yes. Um... My apologies. And how do you calculate every sphere? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, currently we have uh, computer programs um, to calculate those. And um, to not go into too much detail or to explain more, uh, stay tuned for when this paper gets officially published and it will contain more detail and exactly the processes I use to calculate the area, but it was all through um, computer processing. 
Now, Brooke, can you share with us one of the problems you faced during the development of the platform? Yeah, so you know, when you're making a device that hasn't been created before, it's a new design, you know, there's a lot of trial and error. And, um, you know, one thing is when it wasn't permanently bonded, we had problem with uh, the platform leaking. So we just, you know, trial and error, change, you know, what is the design, how we engineered it to fix it. Um, another issue is uh, organoid media, for some reason, is very bubbly, <laughs> like compared to normal, you know, DMEM cell culture media, it was just like would bubble so easily. And if you think if you have bubbles, that would really affect your imaging. So again, that um, came down to like how, you know, the shape of the wells, how the channels were shaped, and like the right, right amount of pressure, and like to be able to pressurize the platform to get rid of those bubbles. And then again, that connects to the leakage. If you're pressurizing the system, you don't want it to leak. Um, so it took a lot of trial and error, but we got both of those issues solved. Thank you, Brooke. How can you compare growth if you are starting from different sizes? Are you adjusting them somehow? Yes, yeah, so I would normalize to the growth of the first image. Um, so actually, in the more thinking about growth compare, um, compared to like the drug sensitivity, Okay, thank you. Now let's see. Um, let's go with this question. How long does it take the organoids to grow before you experiment on them? And what size are they at that point? So how long does it take organoids to, uh, to grow at what size? Or how am I accommodating for the different sizes? So during the growth, they actually all start out as single cells. So they all are roughly the same size no matter what patient it is. Thank you. Okay, and let's see. Uh, do you make devices yourself, and how long does it take? Yeah, we do the whole process here at University of Chicago. We make the molds ourselves. Um, so, you know, as I was saying, you can adjust the number of wells how you want it. Um, and then we make the PDMS devices here in the lab as well. So for the PDM device or PDMS device, I, um, for both of them, I could make them probably in two days, but I make many devices at once in a two day process. So we get a lot done pretty quickly. Great. And we have time for a few more questions. How do you apply pressure through the chambers? Uh, so the fluid is pressurized through the um, multiplexer device. So the part, you have the part one, the organoid chamber device, and then we have the multiplexer. So um, the fluid going in, so not just the valves are, are pressurized, but also the fluid flowing in is pressurized through air around five PSI. Thank you, Brooke. Now it looks like we don't have time for any more questions. Would, do you have any final comments you'd like to leave our audience? Um, again, I would like to, you know, everyone feel free to connect to me. Um, here's like all my social media handles and, you know, don't be shy to reach out. Or if you think of questions later, I would love to talk about it. Or if you guys, if you have any ideas or collaborations, I'd love to hear about it. And then I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I really appreciate people coming and listening about my work. Thank you, Brooke. And I too would like to thank our audience for joining us and for their interesting questions. Again, just a reminder, those questions we did not answer today and those that are submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by Brooke via the email address you provided at the time of registration. And I would once like to thank Brooke Schuster for her time today and her important research. We'd also like to thank Labrits and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and Labrits will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. You will now be redirected to the registration page of our next webinar titled, Modified Dental Composite for Bone Repair. 
presented by Meta Arshad on March 27th at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. We hope to see you there. Have a great day.